Listen to the sound of the angels singing their gospel song. Listen to the joyful news they're bringing. Jesus has come. Glory to God in the highest heaven. Peace on the earth. Hope is rising, fear subsiding. Where the song is heard. So let your gospel song be heard. Raise your voice in.
Sweet sounds of heaven fill the night as strains of glory blend with radiance so bright. And herald angels sing the story of delight to welcome Jesus to the
Listen to the sound of the angels singing their gospel song. Listen to the joyful news they're bringing. Jesus has come. Glory to God in the highest heaven. Peace on the earth. Hope is rising. Fear subsiding. Church Durham Christmas carol service. We usually do this in a big hall and all gather together. We can't do that. So welcome to our service online. It's been quite a year, but we're here to share together in the joy of Christmas. This is a very simple service. Some carols, some Bible readings a little later. Debbie Laycock from Ickford's Christian Fellowship in London is going to be preaching to us. The words you will see are on the screen, and I hope you're able to join in and sing along. I'll let you into a little secret. Sometimes when Ruth and I are in front of the computer and singing together, Ruth just wanders off a little bit so that she can stick to the tune despite what I'm singing. But please be brave, be courageous, join in, share in the joy of Christmas. Uh, finally, we usually say to people, uh, leave your phones behind when you come to worship or put them on one side because they're distracting. But I'm going to ask you today to have your phones nearby because when it comes to giving our offering to Tear Fund later, we're going to ask you to use your phones to send a text to be able to do that. Without further ado, let's commit our time together to the Lord and then celebrate the coming of the Lord Jesus to us at the first Christmas. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that in the Lord Jesus, you reached out to us in our frailty and failure. He came down among us to lift us up from our sin, to help us to find forgiveness and joy and new life. As we celebrate that joy together this Christmas, would you meet us, Lord? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <laughs> Oh, 
This reading is from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this.
Chapter 1, verse 26 through 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her.
from Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to him in marriage and was expecting a baby. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favour rests. When the angels left them and had gone into heaven, the angels said to one another, Let's go to, to Bethlehem and see what's happened, which has been told to us. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told.
Matthew 2, 2 to 12, and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw a star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They then opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Alex, thanks for that reading. Uh, it's now a great pleasure to welcome Debbie Laycock from London. She hasn't actually come from London. She recorded this in the Bonhoeffer Church in southeast London. It's slightly echoey, but there's a lovely Christmas tree. And Debbie's going to speak to us on that passage from Matthew's Gospel. Why don't we just pray? Lord, as we hear from Debbie now, would you speak to us through her words, we ask, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Hello everyone and a very happy Christmas to you whenever and wherever you are watching from. I wonder if you're feeling like it is a very happy Christmas this year. For some of us, perhaps, Christmas is normally one of our favourite times of the year with the music and the carols, the decorations, the food, the nativity story being retold the opportunity for rest and celebration and to be with family. But maybe for some of us, it's never an easy time of year. Perhaps it is often a stressful and a pressured time, perhaps a lonely time. Perhaps it brings back difficult memories or brings home the fact that lost loved ones are not around. But I guess however Christmas normally makes us feel, this year is not normal for any of us. A lot of us will be looking back on 2020 as a tough year. The COVID-19 pandemic has pitched the world into some turbulent and stormy waters through uncharted territory. Many of us have been affected in many different ways, lurching from one challenge to the next, from coping with anxiety to sickness, to caring for others who fall sick to isolating, to working from home, to closing businesses and losing jobs, to homeschooling children, to struggling with new technology, to keeping a handle on our own mental health, to staying away from loved ones, to disrupted plans and lives, to socially distanced weddings and funerals. There have been so many fears to face, so many challenges to navigate. And that's why I want to talk for a few minutes now about these two words, comfort and joy. Taken from an old carol, describing the Christmas message as tidings of comfort and joy. And we need a bit of that this Christmas, don't we? We need it if we're going to be able to gather ourselves up and face 2021 with courage and hope and any sense of optimism, we need to receive the comfort and the joy that Christmas has to offer. And so I want us to think for a minute about some characters in the Christmas story who were mentioned in our Bible reading. Some men who had also been on a long and difficult journey themselves to find the child who had been promised to the world as the King and a Saviour, Jesus. We call them the wise men, or the kings, or the magi. And when they found him, the Bible says that they were overwhelmed with joy. It's as though somehow 
the burden of their journey across deserts and mountains that they'd been carrying with them fell away from them as they fixed their eyes on Jesus. And that's my prayer for us too, that as we focus on Jesus, the centre of the Christmas story, that we'll find our burdens being lifted, our sorrows comforted, and a new joy and strength begin to rise up inside. I guess very practically, the wise men were able to unburden themselves of the gifts they had carried with them all the way from their far off kingdoms in the East. The famous gold and frankincense and myrrh that we sing about in the carols. And perhaps they seem strange gifts for a young child. I'm not sure that my children would be overjoyed to receive any of them, um, unless the gold had been hammered into uh, sensible coins that you could actually use in the shops. But in the way that gifts given to a baby often do, these presents were speaking from the hearts of the givers about who and what they were hoping this child would be. I had a friend uh, many years ago who gave a gift to his newborn son of a baby-sized football strip in the Millwall team colours. It was a not very subtle way of saying, I want him to be a Millwall supporter. He is destined to be a Millwall supporter. And these three gifts of the wise men each tell us something about who Jesus was destined to be. Not just because the wise men hoped it in their hearts, but because God had decided it long ago and spoken it as promises to his people through the mouths of the prophets. And now it was all being fulfilled in Jesus. No wonder they rejoiced. So let's look at these unusual Christmas gifts one by one and see what they can tell us about who Jesus is and what he wants to do in our lives. I want to start with the myrrh, as I feel particularly moved by this gift this year in particular. Myrrh, as you may know, is a strong smelling balm used since ancient times for all sorts of medicinal and ritual purposes. It was used as a healing ointment, an antiseptic and a preservative, and for pain relief. The word myrrh means bitter, and as an ointment, it is often associated with grief and death. What a gift for a young child. But this gift was showing us that the most important thing Jesus would do with his life was die on the cross for the sins of the world, for your sins and for mine. And how his death would drain the bitterness out of our lives, take the sting out of our mistakes and our failures and our regrets, the broken promises, the broken relationships, the pain of where others have sinned against us. Jesus soaked it all up and took it into himself as he died on the cross. And then three days later, he rose again, overcoming both the bitterness of life and the power of death forever. It was a terrible destiny, but a wonderful one too, because it can bring us such comfort at our point of suffering and grief. Perhaps some of us are suffering and grieving as we look back over this year. Perhaps we've lost people we love. Perhaps this year, more than ever, the gift of mercy speaks to us of the healing and soothing of griefs, pains and sorrows that Jesus' death and resurrection brings. The Bible says, surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Grief can be a dark and hopeless place. I remember a friend of the family many years ago who lost his wife in a car accident and was left bereaved with his two young children. And we all ached and grieved with him. Of course, none so much as he. But as we ached, we prayed and we called upon Jesus, the God of all comfort, the one who has been through death and come out the other side. 
and we prayed that he would draw close to our friend and strengthen him. And I'll never forget what he shared after the funeral had happened, how at times he would feel utterly crushed and defeated in his loss. But then suddenly, inexplicably, and seemingly from nowhere, hope would start to spring up in his heart and he would feel lifted and lighter and stronger. And he said, I knew in that moment people were praying for me. I knew it was Jesus. How wonderful that in Jesus we find a God who not only entered fully into human suffering and so can understand the pains and pressures we go through, but who also releases to us the balm of healing, forgiveness, comfort and hope to meet us in every distress. But I also want to talk about the second gift for a moment, frankincense, a type of incense that the Jewish people would have been very familiar with as it was burned during their temple worship. And the sweet smell and the clouds of smoke that it released represented God's presence, the experience of heaven on the earth. And this gift was showing us that Jesus' birth was bringing heaven to earth. It was bringing something supernatural into our ordinary natural experience. It was God getting right under the skin of humanity and making his presence known. I remember talking to two guys that I'd met on the street once when I was out with our church and we were just getting into conversations about God with people, offering to pray for them, um, inviting them to church. And these two guys were telling me that they didn't believe in God. And I said, oh, OK, well, why not? And one of them said, well, I've never had any reason to think he does exist. And the other one sort of said, oh, yeah, I mean, if God is real, then why doesn't he make himself a bit more obvious? And so I said to them, well, that's a brilliant question. And the answer is that he does. If you give him the chance, why don't you let me pray for you now? Uh, that God will make himself known to you. And so they kind of looked at each other and shrugged and, and said, oh, okay, why not? And so I shut my eyes and I started praying for them. And I prayed that the Holy Spirit of God would come and touch each one of them and that their minds would be opened to God's reality and that they would know that Jesus loved them. And when I finished praying, I opened my eyes and they were both staring at me wide-eyed and looking completely freaked out. And one of them had tears in his eyes and he said to me, what did you do to me? What did you do? And I said, well, nothing, I was just praying for you. And he said, I felt this heat go right the way through me. What did you do? And the other one said, well, I felt like a tingling, like electricity, what was it? And I was able to say to them, well, that was Jesus making himself more obvious. And we started talking about what it means to have a relationship with him. And maybe you're listening to this and you are wishing that God would make himself a bit more obvious to you too. Maybe you believe in God. Maybe you are a Christian already, but you're feeling that he is very, very distant. You're wondering if he really is there for you at all. Maybe you don't even know if you believe there is a God. But like a lady I was talking to at a bus stop recently, perhaps you're saying to yourself, surely there must be more to life than this. You want to know if there really is a spiritual realm, if supernatural power can really break into day-to-day -day lives, if prayers really do get answered, if there really is a God who is interested in your life and wants you to know him. Well, that gift of frankincense is telling you that Jesus wants to draw close to you and to make you aware of his reality, the goodness and the power of a living God. He wants to surround you like the air that you breathe and give you that taste of heaven on earth. So I dare you this Christmas time to pray a prayer like I prayed with those guys on the street. Ask Jesus to make himself known to you 
and then wait to see what he will do. Because he never, ever ignores a prayer like that one. And finally, that third gift, the gold. Jesus was given the gift of gold because he was destined to be a king. The king of the Jews, yes, and that was what made their earthly king, Herod at the time, so angry and afraid that someone might dethrone him. Someone might rob him of his power and his position over the Jewish people. And so he made, if you remember, that terrible edict that all the young boys who lived in the Bethlehem area should be killed. It seems incredible, doesn't it, that a child should have caused him so much concern. But I guess he perceived a real threat because he perceived real power and authority in Jesus. Because Jesus is more than just the King of the Jews only, more than just a legend of history. He is the King of heaven and earth, the King of the whole world, the rightful King of your life and mine. He is the one who created this whole universe, who put us together in our mother's wombs, who gave us life. He's the one who has a purpose and a destiny for our lives. If we will choose to ask him about it and discover what it is and walk in it with him. And so he invites us to bow down and worship him and to make him king in our hearts. An atheist friend of mine once said to me, no one is going to be the king of my life except for me. And no God is going to make me bow down and worship him. And that's the thing about Jesus. He doesn't. He isn't a king like Herod. He doesn't come barging into our lives and force us to serve him and with threats and violence make us worship. No, he's a king who came as a baby, humble and vulnerable, inviting us to reach out and pick him up, receive him into our arms, into our hearts, calling us to lay down our treasures before him, like those wise men did. The things we hold most dear in our lives, our life itself, so that he can take his place on the throne of our lives with true power and true authority and show us how to really live life for all it's worth. It can be hard to let go of the reins of our lives, hard to humble ourselves and to acknowledge someone greater. We get used to determining our own path and we don't always readily want Jesus to come and take over even though he is the one, the only one who truly knows the way. But if we will take that step, and if we do offer our lives to Jesus, we find wonderfully that he is a king who enriches our lives with the gold of his blessing, his protection, his provision, his guidance, his love. If we will give up being king and let him take over, like those kings from the East did, if we will come and kneel down and worship him today, we will find that gold pouring in to our lives too. So let's do that. Let's come and worship the King of Kings today and allow him to fill our hearts with his deep, rich, and overflowing joy. God bless you. Thanks so much, Debbie. This has been a pretty difficult year, but we are really conscious that we are privileged compared with many people in the world, despite our current difficulties. And so we're going to do what we do every year as a church, which is to give an offering beyond ourselves. Usually we give to a local charity working with the disadvantaged and to people in another part of the world. But this year, we're just going to give to Tear Fund, a Christian relief agency, and particularly to their Christmas appeal, their work in Africa. 
to introduce and explain that. There's a short video. The people are not speaking in English in the first part of the video. There are subtitles, so you might need to get ready to read rather than just listen. Malawi is uh, affected by hunger because of changing weather. There are times when uh, we have excessive rainfall. In a very short period, we have uh, too much rainfall. It causes flooding, washing away people's crops. Sometimes we have also a dry spell where rains just stop. Therefore, the crops, they lack water to be sustained in terms of crop development. So these two situations, they are affecting uh, people's farming, leading to hunger. A liar is in desperate situation. The men she lies on for food and income is failing again and again. To help communities that are affected by changing weather, tier funds and our partner are teaching them better ways of farming so that uh, they can farm smarter. We help communities to replant trees. We are also teaching them business skills, beekeeping, livestock production, particularly on the goat and chicken rearing. This is very, very, very important because uh, it provides families with alternative so that uh, they are able to sell livestock or honey and then have money which they use it for when they have hunger. Well, we're going to ask you, as part of our worship this morning, to contribute to the Tear Fund Christmas Appeal. You can do this using your mobile phone. The number will appear on the screen. I'm going to give it to you now. And we're going to ask you to send a text to that number, and we will text you back with instructions about how to contribute to that offering. If you'd just like to put in your text Christmas or Xmas, and the amount you'd like to give, then we'll text you back in the next couple of days. The number that you need is 07401 342 729. Now we're going to invite the choir to sing while you make your gift. And at the end of that, we'll pray together. Would you consider how you can be generous to those in much greater need? in other parts of the world and particularly in Africa this Christmas time. God bless you for your generosity in response to his generosity to us.
We're so grateful that God came to be with us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why don't we just pray together? Lord, we acknowledge your generosity to us in so many ways, above all things in the Lord Jesus himself. Lord, as we give with generous hearts to those in need in another part of the world, we pray for the work of Tear Fund, that you would take our gifts and the, those of others and use them to bless those communities. We ask in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Thanks for being with us at our King's Christmas celebration. In a moment, we're going to end our service with one of my favourite carols, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. But before that, we'd just like to invite you to meet people from church on coffee over Zoom. I'm afraid you have to bring your own coffee, but there's information and a Zoom link there if you'd like to join us. And if you'd like to discover more about the Christian faith or try and understand it more fully, we invite you to get information about an Alpha course that will run in early 2021. If you just email alpha at kcd.org.uk, we'll send you some details of how you can find out more about the Alpha course, which introduces the Christian faith. God bless you. Have a great Christmas, whether you're on your own, whether you're here, whether you're with others, whether you're at the ends of the earth. May the Lord be with you.
Shout to all creatures.